All right. Welcome back to Class 4 Wisdom Literature. I'm Pastor Mark Miller, Church of Heartland Berber's Campus. And again, if you want to take this for credit, go to coth.tv or churchoftheheartland.com. Go to Growth Track, select a class, a uh, small fee for the test. And again, this is going to be the class you really want to pay attention because you're going to, we're going to learn how to extrapolate wisdom poetry, wisdom literature from the Bible in a way that makes a little more sense than if you just read it untrained. And so when you go to take that test, the questions are going to be, did you watch lesson one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? And also the, set, the last question will be, did you read two wisdom books of your choice? Two of the five that we go through. So it could be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or Song of Solomon. Any two of those five that, that God puts his finger on for you to read and go through. But I would, I would request that when you go through there, try to use the principles we're going to learn in this session right here to do so. Okay? So the book of Psalms, or it's called the Psalter, it uh, means in the Hebrew to praise. It's a book of praises. And so what it was is the book of Psalms was put together over a period of about a thousand years. The very first psalm was written by Moses himself. And the last psalm was around the time of Ezra, who's believed to be the one who actually put the psalms together as a book. Now, through the times of Israel, you're going through the time of Moses. And what happened? After Moses, Joshua takes them into the promised land, and they go and take the land. They start to establish uh, sacrificial systems right, in, in, uh, in a place where they're not moving from place to place. Now, instead of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire leading them through the wilderness, they actually have places to go meet with God in their promised land. So they're going through there, and what happened in that cycle? They would, they would go after God for a little bit, then they'd start to go after other gods. God would send a judge to pull them back in, and they'd listen for a while, then they'd go back after other gods. Every once in a while, God would judge them and take them into exile, and then they'd get rescued and brought back and restored. And eventually what happened is they get to going from judges to getting kings, and God establishes, first they have Saul, but then David gets established as a king, and he's a king who was a man after God's own heart. And he was known to be a musician, known to be a psalmist who would write songs. And he would put together a lot of songs and different things. And as he went through there, then his son Solomon became king. And the kingdom got tore apart. And then just things happened. You had good king, bad king, bad king. A like, lot more bad kings than good kings, right? And eventually they stopped listening to God and God sent them into exile. And now instead of having a tabernacle, a temple to go see God and meet his presence, they're now dispersed out. And so they started writing little pieces of poetry that would remind them of things of God in the tabernacle, things to praise. And instead of looking back, a lot of the things that David, David, was, David wrote a lot about wanting to be in the tabernacle in his presence. And when he was alive and died before ever seeing the temple born or built, the tabernacle built. And so he's looking forward to the promises of that restoration of that. And what were the Israelites in, in all over the place? They were looking in, they're sitting there in Babylon. Then the Medes and Persians come and take over. And what they're doing is they're writing and looking, they're reading David's Psalms and singing those out, not, not as a way of looking forward to the tabernacle like he was. They're looking forward to a restoration of going back to the promised land, being able to get in God's presence in person again. So this was like the only version of the tabernacle they had to carry with them. And so after all this time, they had way more than, there's 150 collections in there of, of different poems. There were a lot more than that, but these are the books they put together to form the Psalms. Now, the Psalms are, are, are separated into five different books. If you go to read and you start to read Psalm 1, it'll look above there, it'll say book 1. The first book is 41 chapters long, verses 1 through 41. The second one is verses 42, uh, chapter 42 to 72 is book 2. Chapter 73 to 89 is book 3. Chapter 90 to 106 is book 4. Chapter 107 to 150 is book 5. Now, what's some of the things you'll see as you start to read these books? Um, 73 of them were written by David. Almost half that we know of. Um, you have Asaph wrote 12 of them. The sons of Korah wrote 11 of them. Um, you have He-Man, and, and there's, a couple, there's these guys in there that would write one of them. Moses wrote one. Solomon wrote two. And there's about uh, 49 of them that were anonymous. 
They don't know who wrote it. It could have been David, it could have been somebody else. So you have all these different authors, but these were put together in different books. And it's most likely Ezra, the Ezra in the Bible, who put those books into their final compilation and, and created the book of Psalms as we know it. And so you'll even see in one of those, there's, there, I think it's 14 and 53, they're identical same psalm. You read it, it's the exact same one word for word. Well, it's this, it was a favorite in this book, and it was a favorite in this book, so they stayed in both. That's how they were put together. And so understanding that this is poetry and going through times of good and times of bad, even times of exile, we can make sense of this poetry a little better. So when we're talking about poetry, so when we talk about songs and music in, in English language, you're going to do a song. What's, what's the first thing you usually are doing when you're writing a poem or a song? You want to make sure it does what? It rhymes usually, right? Or at least sounds something close to a rhyme. And you also want to make sure it has a similar rhythm pattern, you know? You know, little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds and ways. It's got a system, right? Long came a spider, sat on a spider, eat, frightened Miss Muffet way. For those of you guys who want me to complete that. <clears throat> None of that matters in Hebrew poetry. None of that matters. Their parallelism, what they care about is parallelism of thought. They don't care about rhyme. They don't care about rhythm. They want to make sure that the thought is linked. Not the rhyme and not the rhythm. And so, you have, uh, you don't have to remember these words, but I'll just cement there. So, something called um, synonymous, where the second line repeats the words having the same meaning. There's also uh, synthetic, where it basically adds to the first line. And then, there's, then the third one is antithetic, or let's just say contrast. It contrasts what it is. And we're, I'm going to give you examples after I get done talking about these. Um, then there's climatic, where there's successive lines, or, or it can be called stair-stepping. Building, building, building. Two or three more thoughts instead of one. And every book of wisdom, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, are built this way. Matter of fact, if you turn to your Bible and you use anything but like a Cambridge King James, you'll look... And it's actually, you ever wonder why you're reading Psalms and instead of being long, it's just, it's real choppy. Little line, little line, little line. And it's not verse to verse. It's because they break them into the poet, poetic thoughts. That's how they're actually broke up in, the, in them. So when you open it up and look through there, there'll be one line, you know. And then the next line is either restating that thought in a different way, or it's adding to that thought, or it's showing a contrast. The good do this, the wicked do this. Especially, you see, thinking right away in Proverbs, right? Or you'll see it stair-step on there. <coughs> um, then that also they'll use um, eclectic, where they interweave different kinds in the same one. Then it's also uh, using synonyms, and they use a lot of uh, metaphors. You know, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. His, his name isn't actually a strong tower, but it's, we get the metaphor, right? You know, the Lord is my rock. He's not a rock. He's not made of granite. There's a lot of that in wisdom literature, true, because it's poetry. Okay? All right. So understanding that, understanding that they're more worried about, you can see how strong their wisdom, the wisdom literature would be because the poems are actually strengthening as they go. The other thing to understand is there are psalms of lament where they're crying out and wrestling with God. You can even call them psalms of testimony, even though some of the testimonies are basically talking about how life really stinks right now. The amazing thing is you can see people crying out to God in a very real languished way and God doesn't seem to get upset about it because you'll always see as they lament things, something adjust and it changes to praise. Because if we're real and stop acting like plastic Christians who never have anything go wrong in our lives, none of these things move me. If we get real with God, then he can be real with us. You know, it's just like we know a biblical principle. If you have something happening and you, someone accuses you of something you didn't do, you defend yourself, it doesn't do any good. If you don't defend yourself and allow God to defend you, that's when things happen, right? In this kind of thing, when you start to be real with God instead of acting like you got your act together, then he can get your act together because you can't get it together yourself. We have to spend time with him 
to become like him. But to do that, he's got to get past all that crud that we're trying to hide from him. And Psalms is full of that crud just coming out. You have those Psalms of lament and Psalms of praise. Um, so looking at this, if you read, it's kind of interesting because there's five books of the Psalms. And they actually match up pretty well with the five books of, of the Torah, the law. If you look in the first book of Psalms, it's all about God's dealing in relationship with men. A lot of that's focused on that. And you look at Genesis and what's Genesis about? God's dealing with men and all that. Exodus is the deliverance. And in the second book of Psalms, you have a lot of talk about God delivering. The third one is, is Levi- uh, sorry, Exodus is the exit out. Leviticus which is about the tabernacle. It talks a lot about his dwelling place, the tabernacle in book three. Book four talks about, you know, judgment and falling and going back and forth and struggling with God. What in numbers, that's where a lot of things happened bad, where they were pushing God and testing God. Then Deuteronomy is where they reestablished the covenant. You see the same thing happening in Psalms and it ends out with five books of nothing but praise. And all five of those books have a very clear stopping point at the end of it called a doxology, which is based praise God, right? Every single one of them. And then the last five books of the Bible are just praise, 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 praise. Okay. <laughs> some other things before we get more into this and actually break into some psalms. There are also some, um, some psalms that actually do more of an alphabetical. It's called an acrostic. So Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. 176 verses long and if you read every eight verses is the next letter of the hebrew alphabet there's 22 letters in the hebrew alphabet so it'd be like going from a to z and every verse starts with that letter of the alphabet you know it's like i used to make fun of it i'd be you go to church camp and you know all of a sudden everybody met their lifelong love after knowing them for two hours and then they'd, they'd be written, someone would write a letter and they'd write a letter with their name and they'd use their whole name and they'd make a poem with the first letter with the, each letter of their name an acrostic well, this was a little more serious. They would do that, but they would expound on it. And Psalms 119, was the subject was the word of God and how good it is and praising God for the word. Matter of fact, 174 of 176 verses mentions the word of God in some way. They might call it statutes or, or your ways or something like that, but it's all about the word of God. And so you read the Psalms and you see this, this, this transition, and I talk about the lament. The first half of Psalms, there's a lot of heavy lament with some praise in there. And as it shifts to the end of the Psalms, it goes from lament to a lot more praise. And that happens to us in real life, doesn't it? When you have this lament, when you have stuff happening, nothing really changes for the better until you turn to God and start sharing it with Him. And so saying this too is Psalms can be looked at not just as a song book, but actually a book of prayer. Because what it does is it teaches people how to, as they're struggling to live with the Torah, how to stay connected with God and keep moving forward and overcome how life comes at you. You see every range of emotion in the Psalms. You see everything that people deal with. You see people talking, you know, you, how you're you know, sitting there talking bad about your enemies and grumbling about, you'll see all that in there. You thought it was just you behind the car when that guy couldn't drive. No. They talk about all this stuff. Now, one last thing before we dig into a couple of of, uh, chapters of Psalms here. Um, So if you read the book of Psalms and you go through there, you ever notice that at the top of the book of Psalms, it has little clues as to what they're about? Anybody ever notice that? So like if you go to, uh, if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 1, and it'll say book 1. But then if you go to uh, Psalm 32, it might say a Psalm of David right? More importantly, Psalm 51 says, for the choir director, a Psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Do you realize that those are also inspired? They're part of the original text. They're not just written in after the fact. Those are just as inspired as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Pay attention to those superscripts because they put those in there. And it's a good idea if you look at that and you don't know the story, go back and and get familiar with the story then the psalm will make a whole lot more sense and you're realizing that. A lot of times psalms will teach us how to do something like the Psalm 32 and 51 are directly connected. They're both written by David at the same point in time. Psalm 32 
is about forgiveness. And he needed to know what that was about because he had committed adultery and murder. So I just want to mention that as we get dive in is, is pay attention to what's written at the top because that is also inspired. A lot of people don't realize that. That's not just the author being keep putting. Like, if you want to know chapters and verses, those were never put in the Bible. Those were added after the fact to make it easier to measure your reading and memorize. So Psalms 23 was just Psalms, the next chapter in the book. They didn't necessarily have chapter, verse 1 is the Lord is my shepherd, verse 2, and so on. That wasn't there. But those little indications above there, those were all in the original. That's just as inspired as the rest of the word which means God wants you to pay attention. Just like that word salah you see in there, or interlude in some other translations, where it says salah, that means stop, think. Psalms is a book you want to chew on, you want to soak in, you want to marinate, you don't want to microwave. Take some time and ponder and put yourself in, which is why I'm telling you what the structure of the poetry is, because if you do this, then you're looking, and as you look at that first sentence, you look at the next sentence, okay, is that... Adding to it, is that stair-stepping, is that restating, is that contrasting? How is that going? And you start to really understand and get more wisdom. You're learning from them. So um, let's go ahead and look at the first book, Psalms chapter 1. So if you're doing, I'm going to, so I memorize this way back in King James, but it says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay? I'll read it in the New, New Living. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Now, let's look at the next line and see what it does. And if you're looking at your Bible, you'll notice that it starts a new line right after that, even though there's no period there, because this is the next thought in the poem. Or stands around with sinners. This is adding to it. Do you see that? Or join in with mockers. This is telling you these are all connected, and it's making it real clear. These are blessed if you avoid this. This is it's, it's just adding to it. Then what has happened in verse 2? You immediately have a contrast. But they delight in the law of the Lord. Do you see the contrast? And then they explain, they, they now add on to it, extra, uh, meditated on it day at night. Then you know the next one. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Do you see how that just keeps expounding that verse? This is all poetry. This is also pointing back to the Garden of Eden, by the way. And then it talks about the garden, and then it talks about, you know, and you can look at this, and you can look at it a couple ways. You can see the contrast of the good, and then you see the contrast with the wicked, but you can also look at Adam and Eve before they fell and after they fell. Verse 4, but not the wicked, they are like worthless chaff. Now you see a comparison, right? You see them going through there. So, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. And then here we see a contrast again. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly. Again, but the wet path of the wicked leads to destruction. Do you see all the structure in there? And if you're looking at the scripture, and again, unless you're using the original Cambridge King James, you'll see it's actually set up in poetic structure. And you see where there's a little dash or little spaces there. It tells you where the new thought begins. And you can kind of study that. So let's go to Psalms 32. I said it was more of an instructional one about... Um, how am I doing a time? Okay. So it says Psalm 32. So I said this one's closely linked to Psalm 51 because it came at the same time. So let's think about what happened. David commits adultery with Bathsheba. Her husband, her very much alive husband, who's very loyal to David, is out in a fighting a war, that, a fight that he picked, basically. And he's at home when kings are supposed to be out there in battles that they're supposed to be a part of. And he not only commits adultery with her, he gets her pregnant. So he tries to cover up his sin by getting his, his, his uh, loyal subject, Uriah, back there and trying to get him to have relations with his wife, but he refused. He would sleep outside in the castle there, area there. He wouldn't go and have, uh, have a night with his wife whenever all the other men are out there in war. Stayed loyal. So finally he went out there and he, tells, he basically tells the commander, hey, make sure he doesn't come back alive. And so he gets killed in battle at, at David's command. So David is responsible for all this. And from the time that he does that, you know, we all probably know the story when he gets confronted by Nathan the prophet. And when he tells him the story, there's this guy who had, this rich man who had all these sheep, 
had probably thousands and just wealthy and, and someone comes and there's his neighbor who's very poor and has one sheep and it's like and it's like it's like a member of the family it's like a pet if you ever think god doesn't like pets there's a lot of times he talks about it. he just he, he explains it's like a pet that someone loved and instead of getting one of his thousands of sheep he grabs that only sheep of that guy and he kills it and gives it to his guest and david's like that man's gonna die and nathan goes you are that man David's like, oh. it's about a year's time that he sat there dealing with the, the sin that he covered up. And when he got confronted like that, he confessed it out. And we see Psalms 51's result. But before that, Psalms 32, and you can kind of hear the turmoil he was going through this whole time. Psalm 32, and again, it's in poetic form. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven whose sin is put out of sight. Do you see the, the importance of knowing the story behind this? Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. He finally came clean. And now he's absolved of guilt. Imagine that kind of tally on your record and God wipes that clean. Wow. And he still gets to be called a man after God's own heart after all that. And that wasn't his only mess ups. He had some other doozies too. That cost the lives of many people. Verse 3, listen to this. We get a little insight into David. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength was evaporated like water in a summer heat. And that Salah interlude right there. Stop and think about that. Well, what do we think about? David had done all that. It wasn't like he just spent that year. Yeah, screw you, God. I'm going to do what I want. Party over here. Whoop, whoop. We see some people who do that craziness, don't we? What we don't see is on the inside, they're just twisted and they're weighted down with the guilt. We keep thinking that they, they, they act like it's better on their side. Someone walks away from God when they really knew God, they're never the same and they're never going to be happy even when they act like it. And we're seeing David may have been acting one way, but on the inside, he's just getting tore up. And you're like, you know what? If that happened with David and he did that, I can get some relief for the turmoil I'm going through. There are people who can't forgive themselves for something they did 20, 30 years ago that was horrendous, but they can't let it go. And then you read this and they're like, he knows exactly what I feel. And I'm looking there and it's, oh, it's forgiven. Then it goes in verse six. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Stop and think about that. You see the change as he's going through the turmoil and it's turning into laments, turning into praise. Right? The Lord said, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life and, advise and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or a mule that needs a bit or a bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad all you obey him. Shout for joy, all whose hearts are pure. Look at the ending of that. He went from turmoil, heaviness, to a pure heart and God leading him. And then let's look at the famous one, Psalms 51, where he was right after that confrontation. This is linking right to the exact same time. And what does he say? This is his prayer. We get to see David's repentance prayer to God right here. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. We're seeing David in his sight. Why is he saying that he's only sinned against God? Obviously, he's sinned against other people, but until there's all he can feel is the guilt and the different and the barrier between him and God. He 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 was raised worshiping God out in his, out in the field with the sheep. He'd always known God and had a closeness to him. He was anointed, and all of a sudden, the anointing, the glory departed from him, and it crushed him. And all he cared about is reconnecting with God. Then after that, everything else could fall into place. And then what does it say in verse 6, or verse 5? For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. And you see it's still adding, it's still using that poetic form. 
but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. He's talking about even there he was getting wisdom, all this, and he's seeing that. And what is this? This one is, I love verse 7. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. You're probably thinking about that old hymnal. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Thou wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Verse 8. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. He goes through all this stuff and he's, it's all about restoration to him. And if you read Psalms, it's about this. You wrestle, you see this genuine wrestling and it starts out with some being really raw and really honest and it turns into God getting a hold of them when they cry out and changing them and it turns into praise. Isn't that our life for real? It's not clean, it's messy, but it always ends with us praising God. We've got time to look at one more here. Let's look at Psalm 73. This is right after the first, you know, this is after David. This is Asaph. Asaph was alive during the time of David, but, this, but he was also alive during Solomon, like he was there when the temple got dedicated. And he said, and he's writing a song. This is the first time we're interested in him, and he's writing a song, and he's kind of, he got ticked about something. He got screwed. He almost messed up. And he's being raw with God about this. So let's look at this. So much wisdom in this. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. Starts out good enough, right? But it takes a twist quick on verse 2. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have like troubles like other people. Now we know this isn't true, but he's talking about what he felt. He's given his testimony. And it goes on. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace, clothe themselves with cruelty. They're, these fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and only speak evil, right? And it goes on from there. And then it goes... Um, Verse 10, and so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all the words. What does God know, they asked? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did, and then here's him, he's, he's talking to God here. Did I keep myself, my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper. This is one of those things where um, we have that question. Why are the wicked prospering? And look at this answer, though. Verse 17. Then I went to your sanctuary, God, and finally I understood the destiny of the wicked. You want, I talked about this a little this morning. That you want to know why you want to go to church instead of just watching online sometimes? You get around other people praising God. You start praising God. You get in the sanctuary, and it changes your perspective from horizontal to vertical. And then you start seeing things from an eternal perspective instead of just temporal. And it changes your whole view because all these people who are getting every, off scot-free around here, God never, ever lets his balances of judgment go slack. And even if it has to go through this life to the next, he will make sure that everything is balanced. And either we allow Jesus to balance in our lives or we have to face him for what we've done on our own accord. And that's not something I would envy anybody to do. How much time? Okay. So wrapping, that's a good one to really wrap up because then it goes up to the end here. Um, verse 25, Who am I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. It goes, My health may fare, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And then verse 28, but as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made my, the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Do you see the change from beginning to end? You see an honest wrestle, an honest resolution, and an honest praise. Imagine if we approach God like this. Use Psalms to help you pray honest prayers. And you will see that what happens is just like the book of Psalms. You might start with lament, but as you get and wrestle and you're real with God... He gives you His grace, He gives you His love, He gives you His mercy, and He sets you where you're seeing things from His perspective, and it changes everything. And you go from the same thing you were lamenting and being all Eeyore about, you're now a tigger. Woohoo! And you're praising God, and it's not phony. It's genuine. And so we're going to stop there.
and hopefully you guys can get some good uh, tips to start going through and reading this wisdom poetry.